Pastor, you're on mute. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session on the book of First and Second Samuel. And it is a very important chap uh, book to start with. So before we could start, can I request one of us to please lead us in prayer? Lima Lai Lama, would you like to lead us in prayer? Johnson. Inoila Johnson. I'm looking at for the students who have never prayed before. Inoila Johnson, you there? Okay. Divya, can I request you to pray? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful time that you've given us, Father, to draw near you, Father, to know more of you, Lord, to, uh, Lord, uh, understand from your word, uh, Father, how you dealt, uh, Lord, with your people um, in the Old Testament times, Father, Lord. And, uh, uh, Lord, understand, uh, Father, Lord, uh, uh, how we should be coming to you, Lord, with that reverence, Father, Lord, with that um, surrender, hu humility, obedience. Father, Lord, we uh, pray that fill each one of us, uh, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Fill our pastor, Lord, with your Holy Spirit that uh, she would um, speak the words that you Give her, Father, Lord. You anoint her, Father. You equip and empower her, Father, Lord. I pray for each and uh, each and every one of us here, Lord. Uh, help us uh, that we may uh, discern, Father, Lord. Help us that we may, um, Lord, uh, have this in our hearts, Lord, that uh, we may produce fruit for your glory, Lord. May you be exalted. May you be lifted high in everything. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Devia. I'll just present the notes. So today we are studying on the book of Samuel, the first and second Samuel. But then uh, today we will only take up the first part of this book. The first and second Samuel form one book in the ancient Hebrew manuscript, and they were divided into two books later when they were translating the whole Testament into the Greeks. Uh, we don't know who wrote this book exactly, but then uh, the author of this book, we see that um, the author uh, says, because. Sam, uh, Samuel may have written the first 24 chapters because in 25th chapter we see uh, the death of Samuel. So the later part of the book, the later uh, uh, chapters along with the second Samuel, uh, possibly Nathan and Gad who was trained under Samuel would have written this um, return these chapters uh, because the author has been unknown or compiled and put all together so we uh, we uh, the scholars uh, suggest that you know nathan and gad who were trained under samuel would have written and put them together and this book was written approximately in 1100 bc to 971 BC, the first part, and the second part may be in 931 BC. The location of this book was apparently um, had a school of prophets at Ramah in the central part of Israel, and initially it records about you know, uh, there are three character studies we study in this book about Samuel, Saul, and David. So initially it records about Saul and David would have been 
kept there. And once Jerusalem was established by David as the capital, court records began to uh, would have kept it there and there are book compiled. The very purpose of this book was, along with Numbers, Deuteronomy, Judges, the book of Samuel sought to promote the prophetic view. Obedience to God brings reward and disobedience brings punishment. Very uh, From the very beginning, from the time God uh, led the Israelites out of Egypt, we see that God uh, continuously instilling uh, this very particular, uh, is very particular about this character of obedience, obedience to God. And whoever disobeyed God, we see God severely punishing them just to bring that fear of God into everyone's heart. And First Samuel shows the dangers of making demands on God, spe uh, specifically like Israel desired to have a king when it was before in time. And, you know, and what happened, the consequence that led after that. And we also see uh, First Samuel records the fulfillment. Sorry. First Samuel records the fulfillment of the ancient prophecy that Israel's king would come from the tribe of Judah. So we see that for everything there was a time and God brings the right king from the tribe of Judah in his time. The purpose can be stated in three ways. The record of history of Israel from Judges to the death of Saul, especially to mark the great revival under Samuel's, uh, uh, you know, uh, under Samuel's leadership and also after the dark ages of Israel's, Israel's history. And the second is to record the origin of Hebrew monarchy. And uh, the third is to rise of the two additional offices that is the prophet and the kingship so the three reason israel demanded for a king that is they wanted a leader to direct them in the war second the old age of samuel and the character of his sons third to be like other nation other nations were ruled by a king so even the israel wanted to have a king so that they have a good leadership and god's displeasure over israel's asking for a king we see that chapter 8 to 7 does not mean that god did not intend israel to have a king but he wanted them to wait for a time for everything there is a time and there is a season moses anticipated that people will have a king Someday, the prophecy of Moses will be fulfilled in this chapter by raising Saul as a king. And God's intention for a king was David, a man after God's own heart, not Saul. We'll see that much later when we do a chapter study. People were premature to ask for a king. They did not wait until God gave them a king. So we need to learn to wait on God. And we see Samuel as a man. Uh, I mean, what are the characteristics that Samuel had? He was a priest. He was a prophet. Uh, he was a judge. And he was a kingmaker. The three, uh, you know, role that Samuel play, played was priest, prophet, and a judge. Three roles. And he was a Nazarite from his birth. And he, he was the one who anointed the king as he was led by the Lord. We see the additional information that I would request the class to go through in their notes. The book can be divided upon the key characters, Samuel, Saul, and David. We can do a character study individually also, and that will be part of your assignment. So next week, I will be giving each one the assignment. Uh, we have some major events like the life of Samuel, the anoint how Samuel anointed Saul as a king and uh, Saul becomes the first king of Israel and how Saul sins and the anointing of David when God anoints, how exactly anoints, we will study about that. David and Goliath, David and Jonathan, David the fugitive and the uh, death of Saul and Jonathan. Portrayal of Jesus Christ is a king. The race of king shows us that Jesus is our true king. Beginning of Israel's monarchy, the whole 
book can be themed that way. And yeah, there's unique features and comparison of Book of Samuel with the other books. And then we have the outline. And there's a portrayal of shadow of Christ in this book. Samuel is a type of Christ that he was a prophet, priest, and a judge, and the highly revered by the people, and he brings a new age. David is one of the primary Old Testament portrayal of the person of Christ. He is born in Bethlehem, works as a shepherd, and rules as a king of Israel. And he is anointed king who becomes the forerunner of the Messianic king. We also... Um, See, his typical messianic psalms are born of his years of rejection and danger, uh, as we read in Psalms 22. And God enables David, a man after his own heart, to become Israel's greatest king. The New Testament specifically calls Christ the descendants of David. We see that genealogy in the book of Matthew, uh, de descendant of David according to the flesh and the root of and the offspring of David. Now and then, Jesus has been addressed to the lineage of David because God honored David and he kept that honor throughout his life. This is how God also seeks to honor us when we obey him. So with this, we will move on to our chapter study. Chapter study with the reference. So though um, you know Samuel was not did, though Samuel did not write the whole book, but this book was named as the book of Samuel because it's uh, because of, uh, it describes about his great ministry in Israel and and uh, and the legacy of it. I'll just add some of our students. Okay. So after Israel was rescued from slavery, so we we'll look at the background even before we could move to this book. So after Israel was rescued from slavery in Egypt, and they made a covenant with God at Mount Sinai. And eventually they came into the promised land and there Israel was supposed to be faithful to God and obey the covenant, obey the covenant. But before the before the book of Judges, uh, you know, before uh, the book of Samuel and Judges, Judges, Israel failed at many tasks and it was a period of moral chaos and it showed Israel needs uh, a faithful leader. So we, uh, we see in this book of Samuel how uh, Lord raises Samuel in the three areas, uh, you know, as a prophet, as a judge, and as a leader, as a priest, and then as a uh, as a judge, a leader. So in all these three areas, how Samuel excels, we see. And uh, this book of Samuel has 31 chapters and it has a very fascinating stories of these three key people or key leaders that is Samuel, Saul and David. Uh, we see that in uh, from chapter 1 to chapter 7, we see that Samuel uh, as a key leader, priest and a prophet. And then later we see from chapter 8 to chapter 31, the story of Saul, how Saul was appointed as a king and how Saul reigned and, uh, and then also shows us downfall and his tragic death. And in this story, we see Saul's dem uh, uh, demise is matched by David's exciting rise to the power. The third part, we see how David raised, um, David was raised as a king from chapter 21. Uh, you know, we see how David was raised as a king and um, and how from a very simple shepherd boy to the king and how he had a heart uh, uh, for God and for the people and how he reigned and ruled them. So in chapter one, in chapter one, we see it starts 
uh, the book starts uh, 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 you know uh, with the uh, with the family of elkana elkana he was a certain descendant of zap and this family line shows he was a levite if when we read later in uh, one chronicles chapter 6 16 to 30 we see that uh, he is called as ephraimite ephraimite here because his family lived in the levitical city in the on the boundaries of ephraim not because of the tribe of ephraim but he is from a levite tribe so elkana had two wives two wives uh, yes those days polygamy was practiced so he had two wives one was uh, pineha who had children peneha and anna who had no children and we see how uh, how peneha uh, badly treated hannah for being barren and anna uh, was in grief and we we read that uh, she goes to the temple uh, every year they had a practice of going to the temple on a particular feast to offer the sacrifice and here when elkana goes with his family the uh, you know peneha and hannah and uh, peneha's children uh, to offer a sacrifice we see that in verse chapter 1 verse 5 can one of us please read chapter 1 verse 5 but to hana he would give a double portion for he loved hana although the lord had closed her womb So in chapter four, we see that when the time came, Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portion to Peninnah's wife and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah double a portion. Why? Because he loved her. He never looked down upon her weakness. He never looked down that she is not able to give him a son. But then he loved her and he gave her double the portion of the meal. although the lord has closed to him for a revival at provoked and we see the later part elkana uh, you know hana was grieving with her and you know she goes inside the temple and prays this way can we read can we read from 11 onwards sorry 10 onwards verse 10 and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the lord and wept in anguish then she made a vow and said o lord of hosts if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maid servant and remember me and not forget your maid servant but give but will give your maid servant a male child then i will give him to the lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head thank you so we see he is praying and asking god to bless her with a male child and also we see a vow there what is that vow called nazarite vow yes the nazarite vow which we studied in the last book okay the nazarite vow no razor shall come upon his head and it happened as she continued praying before the lord eli was the priest in the temple in those days he watched her he watched her pray and now uh, can one of us read from verse 13 onwards class be active please take turns and read now hana spoke in her heart only her lips moved but her voice was not heard therefore eli thought she was drunk So Eli said to her, "How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you." But okay. Hannah answered, "Go ahead, go ahead." But Hannah answered and said, "No, my lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord." Okay, thank you. So we see here, Hannah goes into the temple and she prays. She prays. You know how she prays. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So when she prayed, she prayed from her heart. 
she just whispered she just whispered you see there was an earnest and a fervent prayer god or she never screamed she never uh, uh, you know she never screamed out of her voice but then even the whisper god hears every whisper that we make every earnest and fervent prayer is powerful it has the power to bring the miracle it has power to bring the heaven down your god heard a prayer and answered exactly how she wanted she asked for a male child and god blesses her with a male child and even eli before she could leave the temple eli blesses her in verse 17 says go in peace and the god of israel grant your petition which you have asked of him and as she went you know later part verse 20 we see hana been conceived and bore a son and she names him samuel because i have asked for him from the lord you know god blessed hana exactly the way she prayed and what happens here we see just like uh, how she prayed and made a vow she is prepared with her heart to offer the child back to god okay and but she waits till the child is been weaned she prepares and once the child is weaned out you know they go uh, as they used to visit the temple once a year so when that feast came along with the family elkana takes his wife anna and pinia they go with the child to the temple and they offer samuel back to god as per the vow and then samuel stays back there and you know uh, anna yes it is a first born but she kept the word what she promised she kept the vow with god and rejoicingly she is offering the child not with any much not with much pain but she rejoicingly we see how uh, how she offers the child back to god and here she sings hannah's prayer there's a poem uh, here in chapter 2 chapter 2 it's all about god opposes the proud and exalts the humble about how despite tragedy human are evil but god is working out his purpose in history and also it's about how god will one day raise up an anointed king for his people and hannah's poem here in chapter 2 placed here at the beginning of the book to introduce these key themes that were uh, that we are going to see throughout the whole story and in chapter 2 verse 20 Chapter two, verse twenty. Chapter two, verses twenty. Before, sorry, sorry. You can read from verse eighteen onwards. Okay, but Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen effort. Each year, his mother made him a little robe and took it to him. When she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice, Eli would bless Elkana and his wife, saying, "May the Lord give your children." by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the lord then they would go home 21 and Verse the lord, 21. and the lord was gracious to Han- hana she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters meanwhile the boy samuel grew up in the presence of the lord yeah so we see how the child was with in the temple with eli and the child grew and the mother used to visit the child every year during the feast and she used to get him a robe robe uh, you know samuel used to wear a robe as a young child and uh, you know used to serve in the temple and by the very act of anna keeping up a vow you know eli blesses her that you know eli prays and asks god to less and uh, we see god's abundance you know whenever we offer the first fruit or anything that god want to expects us to offer with whole our heart you know god always blesses us abundantly exceedingly above and beyond that we could ask think or imagine 
we see that in verse 21 when Anna offered one child but here God blesses her with three sons and two daughters so that she is not left without any children after Samuel. God wipes away the name of Baron from the whole, uh, you know, uh, uh, family. And uh, he wipes away, he takes away the shame that she had to face with the people and especially with Phinea. But here God blesses her in abundance. He blesses her with three sons and two daughters. And we also see the rise of Samuel. In verse 26, we see how Samuel grew. He grew in, uh, you know, he grew in uh, stature and in favor both with the Lord and the men. That's how God was there with Samuel. And later part, we see how Samuel encounters God in the temple. Chapter 3, we see how Samuel encountered God uh, 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 God as he continued to serve under the leadership of Eli. We see in this chapter, chapter 3, Eli is uh, getting old and his eyes were getting dim. And Samuel was sleeping. And in the night, God called Samuel three times. And each time Samuel thinks Eli is calling and he goes to Eli and he asks, did you call me? And Eli gets to know it was the Lord. And Eli advises Samuel saying, next time when the Lord calls, in verse 9, we see uh, Eli uh, tells Samuel, speak, uh, you, when you hear God calls you again, you say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And when the Lord called him again, Samuel responds in the same way and Lord starts speaking to him. So this was the first prophecy that Samuel receives from God and he reveals and he shares it with Eli as well about his own sons. And uh, in verse 19, we see how Samuel grew and the Lord was with Samuel and let none of his words fall to the ground when Lord speaks to Samuel. The words that he uh, that he declared to the people of Israel as prophecy, not one failed. As said in Isaiah 55, 11, you know, every word that comes out of our mouth shall not return void, but it shall accomplish the purpose what it was sent for. So every word, every prophecy that Samuel shared was fulfilled. We see uh, in chapter 4, in chapter 4, we see Samuel grows up and becomes a great prophet and a leader for people of Israel. And at the same time that the Philistines rise to power as Israel's arch adversary. And in this crucial battle, the Israelites get arrogant. And instead of praying and asking God for help, they you know, they try to carry the Ark of the Covenant as a kind of, a, you know, a magic trophy. They think, if I carry the Ark of the Covenant before us, we will win the battle. Yes, they did that before when the sea was separated. And, you know, they also, uh, they went around, around the city of Jericho. Okay. All that was as per the instruction of God and under the leadership of Moses and Joshua. But here, people on their own thought, on their own imagination, they just carried the Ark of the Covenant into the battlefield, but then they lost the battle. And Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant and they took it back. And in this chapter, we also see the death of Eli. So now when the Philistines uh, took the Ark of the Covenant and they placed it inside their temple, inside uh, their temple of their god Dagon. And then the god of Israel defeats the Philistines uh, and their god Dagon without any army. He sends a plague on the people and the Philistines. And uh, the god of Dagon also falls down and he breaks in pieces in front of the Ark of the Covenant. So with this, Philistines get scared. And they send back the Ark of the Covenant to Israel. And at this point, God is, uh, and at this point, Israel uh, is able to understand that God uh, is not, uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant is just not a trophy. Uh, 
but it is you know uh, we need to honor the ark of the covenant and also we see that uh, god of israel uh, you know opposes the pride of the philistines and at the same time even his own people israel needs to correct themselves and come to the point of obedience so that they will be blessed again god is teaching the lesson to israel saying when you obey there's blessing and when you disobey there's the consequence of those disobedience and later part we see in chapter 8 to 10 1 Samuel chapter 8 to 10, it opens up with the large section of uh, Israel. Sorry, Israel come to Samuel and they ask for a king because now the Isra uh, Israel is seeing all the other nations around them have king. So they ask and they demand for a king before time. God is all knowing. God knows what we need what we need they should have waited for god's time but instead of that they uh, you know they hurry up the process and they go and demand for a king with samuel and we see samuel is upset with these people's demand but then you know being a judge being the priest being the uh, a prophet of this people samuel just goes front of god and he consults God and says, and asks God, what is, what is next, what we could do? And God instructs, you know, uh, uh, God sees the motive of Israelites. Their very motive is all wrong. But, he, but God says to uh, Samuel, if they need a king, and if the king is all they want, let's go raise a king. And here God, uh, you know, raises Saul as a king. And, so, uh, and Samuel goes and anoints Saul as a king. And in chapter 13 onwards, we see, in chapter 9, we see Saul has been, uh, Saul has been chosen as a king. And in chapter 10, uh, we see how Samuel anoints the first king. He poured the flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, it is not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance. And when you have departed from me today, you will find two men. You know, uh, Samuel prophesies to Saul what he needs to do and he appoints him as a king. And then uh, in chapter 11, Saul goes for battle and he fights few battles and he wins. And also at the same time, he loses certain battle. And in chapter 17, sorry, chapter 16, we will move on with this to uh, chapter 16. I would encourage each one of you to please go through each and every chapter so that we will understand how Saul uh, reigned and how he won the battle and why he lost few battles and the character of Saul we will get to know when we study these chapters. We will move on to chapter 16, what happens in chapter 16. Can one of us please read chapter 16 verse 1 to 13? chapter 16 verses 1 the lord said to samuel how long will you mourn for saul since i have rejected him as king over israel fill your horn with oil and be on your way i am sending you to jesse of bethlehem i have chosen one of his sons to be king but samuel said how can i go Saul will hear about it and will kill me. The Lord said, take a, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied. Yes, in peace. 
I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Concentrate yourself and come to me and come to sacrifice with me. Then he concentrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord anointed stand anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinabad and had him pass in okay. front of Samuel. But Samuel okay. said, Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. So uh, we see that uh, before we could start with the story of David, we see the end of Samuel. So, you know, Samuel, sorry, end of Saul. So Samuel confronts Saul of Israel and uh, he had warned the people that they they would only, we see that, sorry, we see that uh, the uh, spirit of the Lord is moved. The anointing has been moved from Saul. And, uh, uh, you know, God says he is not the king. And uh, and uh, Saul has been grieving. In the verse 1, we see that Saul has been, Samuel has been grieving because there's no king for Israel. And God says, how long will you mourn for Saul? Come, let's raise a king. And your uh, Lord is leading Samuel to go to Jesse's house to appoint a king and here when he goes to jesse's uh, uh jesse's house and samuel is asking introduce me all your sons and here jesse's introducing each son and uh, the first son eliab when he was introduced samuel thought he is the one surely the lord's anointed is before him but then the lord said to samuel do not look at the appearance as god does not see the appearance but he sees the heart Okay, so he refuses him and then Jesse introduced many other sons one after the other. But then again and again, Lord says, the Lord says, this is not the one. And um, we see in verse 11, Sa uh, Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? And he said, there remains the youngest and there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Go and bring him. So he sent and brought David. He was a Rudy with the bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said to Samuel, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. And that day forward, you know, so Samuel, uh, okay, uh, from that day forward, uh, the Spirit of the Lord was upon David. Yeah. So uh, we see how uh, David was taken into the later part. We see how uh, uh, David was taken into the kingdom to, you know, serve Saul. And uh, as he was, he, as a skillful musician, he was introduced to Saul. And whenever uh, Saul was distressed with the evil spirit, he was asked for David to play the harp. And whenever David played the harp, Saul was delivered from that distressed spirit. And uh, later part, we also see um, Yeah, later part we see when uh, when he <clears throat> there was a uh, there was a battle between the Philistines and the Israelites. The armies were gathered, and uh, there we see a giant Goliath, uh, uh, Goliath who, who who came to who came against the uh, who came against the Israelites, and we see that. Uh, we see that in verse 26, chapter 17, verse 26, when David was bringing the food for his brothers at the, uh, at the battlefield, at the army, and he sees they were gathered. And then David asks uh, a man who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David 
knows his identity is in God. With this boldness, he asks. And then David, uh, later part we see in verse 32, David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Whereas the Israelite army was so fearful to face, to face his mighty giant and Philistines. But then David, being a young shepherd boy, with full of courage and strength, he goes to King Saul and asks if he could go against him. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth and he, and he a man of war from his youth. Verse 34, we see that. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep." And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its bear and struck and killed. And your servant has also killed the lion and bear. So I have been courageous in handling these animals, the, the wild beast in the forest to uh, safeguard the sheep. And this man is nothing. I can go ahead. And so Saul, uh, we see the later part. Uh, verse, yeah, verse 38, we see that how uh, David with his armor, uh, Saul clothed David with his armor and he put a bronze helmet on his head and he clothed him with a coat of mail and David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk for he had not tested them and David said to Saul I cannot walk with these and I have not tested them so David took them off David took them off and then he took a staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistines. Though Saul gave him the armor to fight against the Philistines, but David trusts on the God of Israel. He trusts on the God of Israel and he took just his staff with which he had fought his previous battles and he took a slingshot with five pebbles, stones and he comes to the Philistines and here, you know, uh, when the Philistines looked David, you know, they said you're only a youth, a rubby and a good looking. So the Philistines said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with stick? Uh, Okay, and the Philistines cursed David by his gods. And the Philistines said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beast of the field. But then David said to the Philistines, you come to me with a sword, with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. We see the boldness in David. We see the trust that he had was not in the sword and, you know, uh, in the armor, but then he trusted on God, the Lord God of Israel who was with him. He knew his identity and he also did a very bold declaration. You know, in verse 46, we see the bold declaration. It's not like he heard and he said something, but he knew his identity is in God. The God who gave him the strength and courage to fight against the bear and the lion and this uncircumcised Philistine is nothing for him. 
with the boldness he faces the Goliath and he takes, you know, he takes the first pebble with a slingshot, he hits and he, you know, the stone sunk into the forehead of this giant who was standing in front of him. And David, being a young boy, runs. And what happens? The power, uh, the power of God was present there. That made the Goliath, the giant, to fall on his face down. And we see the victory that God gave Israel today. So David, being a young boy, immediately he runs and he takes the knife of Goliath and cuts his head, as what he said. And when the Philistines saw this very act and they knew that they lost this battle, the very act of courage of David brought fear to the whole army of Philistines. Though they were large in number, they were, they were prepared for the battle. They had the weapon with them, but the fear made them to run in front of one courageous young boy. Today, God is looking at us. No matter how big giant we are facing today, no matter how big mountain we have in front of us, but God is asking, look at the God who is much bigger, much greater. When we trust on that God, that greater power gets operated in and through us. The Lord who operated his power in David through that small pebble with what he had, what, with what he was killed, we don't have to be worried of, you know, the skill and the talent. Do we have equally to the job that we are handling today or to the people who may, whom we may face or the trouble or the circumstance that we are heading? But God is asking us to trust on him who is much greater than anyone. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. We need to trust on him to win our battle. David trusted on God more than anyone on anything. He was not pleased with the king's support, nor he was not pleased with the army that was backing him up, nor he was not pleased with the boldness, but he knew his victory is from God. He trusted on God. He put his life on risk, but then he knew the Lord was with David and the Lord gave him the victory. Today, you and I need to trust on this powerful God, knowing that the Lord is with me and the Lord will give me the victory despite of my weakness. David was not prepared for the battle. He was not wearing the, uh, you know, the soldier's uh, armor. But then he went in the name of the Lord with the skill that he had. He went with the stick and with the slingshot with five pebbles. But the victory was from God. He fought the battle, but the God gave him the victory. He could kill the giant and carry his head and come as he declared to God. God gave him the victory. Today, God is asking us, can we trust God like David? Even before God could anoint him, David, you know, God saw David a man after his own heart. Can God see that in us? Can God be pleased in us like how he was pleased with David? Can he call us, you are the son after my own heart. You are the daughter after my own heart. Can we be God's delight like how David was his delight? The later part of the uh, book, we see the friendship of Jonathan and David, and we see how uh, Saul saw the spirit of the Lord was on David. And he also knew within him that David would be the next king. But then Saul desired his generation to be raised as the king. But then we need to know God raises king and he uh, brings them down. It's his choice, but we need to obey God and all the area of our life. And we see how Saul sought to kill David and how David ran into the wilderness to save his life from, from the king Saul. And we also see there were two instances where David could 
king uh, could kill Saul. But then David fears God and leaves because he says, even you have been anointed by God. How can I, uh, how can I place my hand on the anointed one? Though uh, Saul has been acting cruel, very cruel to David, but then David spares his life and leaves the vengeance belong to God. He leaves him to God's hand and we see his own sin, you know, leads to the consequence of his death. Again and again, we see the scripture been fulfilled. The wages of sin is death. So we need to watch our life. When God blesses us, we need to be more conscious, cautious on our life. The way we lead, we need to lead our life with the obedience to God and humble ourselves under his hand. Even when he exalts us, we need to carry and we, this should be our prayer. Lord, help me to be humble in front of you and the people who you have placed us. Never boast about the position because position is not permanent. It can be changed. It can be changed. But who we are in Christ, who we are in God is our identity. David delighted in his identity, not in his kingship, not in the position, but David delights in the Lord. That's why, you know, we see that it is more blessed for me to be in your presence than to be anywhere else. And God is pleased with David because he worshipped God truly from his heart. In the coming book, we will study more in detail about David and how he handles the, you know, how he conducts himself under the obedience of God. And even though David fails, how he, how he, you know, uh, goes up with a repented heart with God, we will study in detail from David's life. So I would recommend each of us to please study on these three characters from this book about uh, Prophet Samuel, King Saul and King David. What made Saul to rise as a king and what made him to lose the same kingship? And what made David to raise as a king? What made God to appoint David as a king? And what made God to say that David is after my own heart? We need to do a study on this so that we understand with what God is pleased. So that when we study on all these three characters, we can, you know, have a watch over ourselves, over ourselves so that we can be warned in every area of our life and we can conduct ourselves, you know, which pleases God. So with this, we will end today's class. And uh, can I request one of us to please lead us in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege you have given us to learn from your word. As we learn today, God, help us to keep you in mind in every circumstances and help us to be humble even when you lift us up in our circumstances, oh God. We pray, oh God, that we will be able to live a life which is pleasing in your eyes, oh God. We thank you for Pastor Diana to share your word with us and help us to grow more in you and let your word richly dwell inside of us, oh God. Amen. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining in today's session. See you all tomorrow in continuation of the book of Samuel. Thank you. God bless. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God, God bless. bless. You. God bless.